even if the impact of COVID-19 is sinking in and citizens across the world are learning to tackle lockdown, we believe that this is a time when it is vital to allow for a free flow of knowledge and scientific information. GLF's Brave New World was born out of this intent. On behalf of Namitha Gokhale and William Dalrymple and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome to a brave new world. I do hope you've been watching some of our brilliant sessions with Margaret Atwood, Jhumpa Lahiri, James Mallison, Shubha Mudgal, Stephen Greenblatt, Anne Applebaum, Vivek Menon, Grace Gabriel, and many others. If you've missed these, you can catch them on our Facebook page, GLF LitFest, and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur LitFest JLF. To tell you more about the stellar list of writers we have lined up for you in the rest of the season, please welcome festival directors, Amitha Gokhale and William Dalrymple. Friends of books, friends of literature, friends of the festival, it is an absolute delight to watch the enthusiasm with which a new initiative, JLF, Brave New World has been received. Our stellar sessions are around books, around ideas, and around coping mechanisms which help us understand the uncertainties, the surprises, and indeed the shocks of our time. Do tune in, do listen in, do engage as we search for this brave new world. Hi there, we've put together an incredible literary festival for you online, JLF Brave New World, all the writers we love most at Jaipur, Peter Frankopan, Jhumpa Lahiri, Margaret Atwood, have been joined by a whole galaxy of stars we've never dreamt of actually getting to the festival. People, people like Peter Carey, uh, Evan Duval, Alain de Botton. It's an incredible lineup. Um, Ohan Pamuk, Neil Gaiman, I mean, really, it just goes on and on and on. Come and join us, Brave New World, every Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday evening on a phone or laptop near you. Thank you, Namita. Thank you, William. Our official radio partner is Red FM Bajate Raho. Our very first session today on JLF's Brave New World is The Crown. Based on his award-winning play, The Audience, Peter Morgan turned the life of Queen Elizabeth II from the 1940s to modern time into one of the most successful television shows of all times, winning Golden Globes and Emmys along with an extraordinary global viewing figure. Here he talks to filmmaker Ritesh Patra about how he wrote The Jewel in the Netflix crowd. Peter Morgan is an internationally award-winning writer for stage, screen, and film, as well as receiving an Oscar and BAFTA award nominations for his screenplay for Stephen Freer's The Queen, starring Helen Mirren. Morgan has won a host of international awards, including the Golden Globe, the British Independent Film, and the Evening Standard British Film Awards. Morgan wrote the award-winning Western play, The Audience, starring Helen Mirren, and more recently, The Crown. Ritesh Batra is a BAFTA award-nominated writer and director who was named one of Variety's 10 directors to watch in 2017. His most recent film, Photograph, premiered at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival and was released by Amazon Studios in May. Batra's debut feature film, the Lunchbox, starring the late Irfan Khan in a stellar role, and Nimrat Kaur, was supported by Sundance and premiered at the 2013 Cannes Film Festival, where it won the Grand Rail d'Or. It was one of the best-reviewed films of the year and was nominated for the 2015 BAFTA Awards for Best Film, not in an English language. Please remember to comment and ask questions by typing it in the comment section and Ritesh and Peter Morgan hopefully will answer them. Do follow our handles GLF Lit Fest on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions and in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues and I promise you it happens all the time you can find us on our YouTube channel Jaipur Lit Fest GLF. In case we drop off which is also possible hang in there I promise you we'll be back on one of the many social media channels. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Morgan and Ritesh Patra in The Crown. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, Peter. Hi. So nice to meet you. So nice to meet you. A real pleasure. A real treat for me. 
uh, you know, uh, we are meant to talk about the crown. Uh, but I must tell you, I've been a big fan of your work, uh, The Last King of Scotland. And growing up, uh, and I was excited to read this about you, your involvement in this movie, because growing up, I was a proud owner of the VHS of King Ralph. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> We, 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 we must find another way to start. That, that, that's, yeah. that's a slightly painful memory. <laughs> no, but I do. I, do. <laughs> I did love that movie. It, it was, it's really funny. It's really funny. It, it was, um, yeah, 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 actually. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, there are other things of which I'm perhaps a bit more proud. Yeah. Uh, someday I will, I will tell you more about, about uh, <laughs> my viewings of King Ralph as a kid. And... Uh, <laughs> And yeah, we we'll someday we'll have to grab a coffee and talk about King Ralph exclusively. Uh, but hey, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to start selfishly with uh, just something I've been wondering about um, a lot in my own work, and and you know, just being a history buff of you know my own history, the whole recent Indian history and and the colonial times, and also I'm a big I'm a big fan of Russian history, and you know, there's this big morass of of events and characters. And I read a little bit about your process from your uh, infrequent interviews uh, about you waking up at six in the morning, spending time alone, interacting with the research team. But I was just wondering about the, how do you sift through that morass of history and characters? What is it for you alone, sitting on your desk or facing the blank page? And how do you find find the story of each episode. What is your first kind of step if you can articulate that? And I know it won't be the same for every episode or every story, but how do you go about that? It, it seems to me like a big, a, a, a pretty big task, finding all these nuggets of information and turning them into stories. But what is the first step for you? Um, well, um, I mean, the first step is, uh, I, I, I'll preface this by just jumping back actually to a film festival that I once went to in Santa Barbara, where um, where every year, where it was when I was there with doing the promotion for the for the film The Queen during the Oscar season, and they get a bunch of writers uh, on 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 stage and and ask them, and all the writers nominated for the movies that year. And I remember the movies nominated that year were Babel, The Departed, Little Miss Sunshine, um, The Devil Wears Prada, although I'm not sure that's nominated. Anyway, uh, Juno. I, and and, and um, they were asking all of us what our process was. And, and when the answers came out, they were so different. You would never think that we all did the same job, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the approach that different writers have. I was somewhere in the middle between, you know, uh, a very, very ordered, regimented uh, uh, person who did Little Miss Sunshine and a more free-flowing person who did um, uh, Babel. But um, uh, with a long-running show like The Crown, Roughly, what's happened? As I see it, if I, if I, of course, when you start, you don't know what your process is. You're just doing it, and then afterwards, you look back and think, "Oh, that was my process." Uh, uh, it, each season has roughly been about a decade, and and so what I do is I look at a decade, uh, and I I I need to see what all the major events were historically politically, culturally. Then I need to look through the eyes of various characters and say, what were the major events for those characters in that decade? And then I just start making a list of all the things that I think it should be about, and I'm being fed all the time by research. And, and bit by bit, I start throwing out what I call the bad ideas and, and trying to find slightly more surprising ideas. and and. Um, it is undoubtedly the most satisfying creative part of the process for me, much more satisfying than the actual writing, is the mapping out of the season <clears throat> where I, and it takes me a long time. So it's a, it, it's a disproportionately 
uh, time consuming thing where I just look at the shape because in each season there are 10 episodes and you don't, you obviously have to consider not just what happens in each episode, but actually how the episodes sit together because the way in which people are watching television now, they're watching two or three episodes at a time often. Mm -hmm. and, and so you're having to actually almost not just look for a satisfying flow within the episode, but a satisfying flow within the season. And, uh, and I enjoy that process a lot, actually. Um, and, and I think of it as um, in, in, in country houses in England, old country houses, when you turn on the bath, often dirty water comes out first, you know, like the rust from the pipes <laughs> and the plumbing. And you have to let it run for about five minutes until the clean water comes. And then you can put the plug in and let the bath fill up. And I feel it's like this with the ideas. The, the first ideas that come out are terrible. Um, and and, and uh, I have to have the patience to run through the bad ideas, the rusty water, as it were, before, before, before I find the better ideas. And, and it can often take me six, nine months just to plot a season. Okay, okay. You know, uh, something interesting that you just said, and I, I wanted, to, wanted to touch on it, but uh, we may as well get into it. It's, you said something really interesting about the, the, uh, the audience consuming a certain number of episodes at a time. Now, obviously, every episode is its own story. But what goes over these episodes is, is these, you know, wonderful relationships that you've created. And, and, you know, like the relationship between the queen and her sister, between her and Prince Philip. And the trajectory of these relationships over episodes, of course, that's a big part of your mapping process. Right. When you, when you start mapping this out, a season. Yeah, and then what, what can then also happen is that you can be surprised by various, act, various actors and that you suddenly realise that in the hands of some actors, the story pops more than in the hands of other actors. And so then you start rearranging. Now, what, you, know, you write the season as best you can, and I, I try to have it entirely written before we start filming. But then when, when, when we start filming, you suddenly, and you're working with different actors because we change the cast from time to time, you suddenly realise, oh, my God, this actor's sensational and is bringing something that I would not have dreamt of and have, has brought an, a character to life that I had overlooked. And so then what happens is you slightly start rearranging the season again based on the equipment that you've got, all these wonderful mm -hmm. actors, you know. And uh, um, But... Uh, in answer to your question, I found out this. That I'm, I'm sort of was learning on my feet, really, because um, Netflix told me that, that you know that, that two and a half hours is the average amount of time that somebody spends watching drama, and uh, obviously that's not particularly satisfying because you think they may have stopped halfway through an episode. But let's, that, that was their aggregate amount, you know, the the average. And so you do have to consider that people are not going to be just watching one episode at a time. Um, in many ways, I would prefer it if people watch just one episode at a time, but I, I don't have any control over that. And, and so um, uh, you do have to think about episodes in, in, in pairs and in triplets sometimes. Yeah. And so you think of these relationships, like, you, from your research or your reading or, or, or just by the function of, you know, growing up there, uh, you had a, a germ or a, or a sense of the conflict between the queen and, and princess and her sister. Um, but then are you, are you selecting, uh, when you're going through this, uh, all the research and the history, uh, do you find yourself also selecting events that will accentuate that conflict? Or do, uh, did those conflicts actually a fact of history? You know, the points of conflict between them? Well, I mean, sometimes 
this is a family about whom everyone knows everything and no one knows anything, you know, and, and there's a lot, on the one hand, we know everything about them. For, in the case of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh and the Prince of Wales, we know from official records where they were and what they did every single day that they're alive. But those are just official records. They attend here, they, they go there, you know. When it comes to imagining what they feel, um, that has to be, to some degree, an act of uh, creative imagination. Um, and, there, you know, no historian is going to be able to tell me. Um, and in the course of this process, I've learned that most historians can't be trusted anyway. So that history is in itself its own fiction. Um, but there's something dishonest about it in that it masquerades as official history. Um, and so uh, uh, you then have to do that. And I'm, I, you know, I can't pretend to know whether I've got it right or wrong. I only make, um, uh, I make educated guesses. And, and again, you know, you have instinct as a filmmaker. I mean, in your wonderful film, which I was telling you before we started, you know, uh, The Lunchbox, which we were watching last night, there are every, every, you're making judgments as a writer and as a director for how you imagine the character would react emotionally in, in every situation. And I have to do those, I have to make those same guesses, but I hope that the more you know your character, they become less wild uh, guesses they become informed guesses, but they're still only guesses. Sure. So I don't know if it's really true how much conflict there was between the two sisters, but I could imagine that for, I do know that Princess Margaret was the more educated, well, the, more, the, the more flamboyant, the more intelligent, the more extrovert, the more naturally suited to leading. Mm. And, and Elizabeth is more suited, wanting, desires a, a life out of the spotlight. But, you know, uh, uh, she would be happiest as a countrywoman, you know, tucked away mm. somewhere. So it, then you can immediately see, well, hang on a minute, it should have been me, it should have been me, it should have been, you know, you can see mm. a, 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 a delicious conflict in some way, mm. even though... Princess Margaret would have been the most dutiful, uh, loyal, supportive sister in public. You can imagine that she would have had some resentment in private. She's only yeah. human. Yeah, and and you know the day the day you you locked into that must have been a great writing day. Must have been a great writing day to know that you'll have you have that and you can carry it over over episodes and seasons. Um, you know I. Uh, one of the episodes that I watched, it reminded me of uh, this quip Nehru had made uh, in jest. Somebody had asked him, you know, uh, after India got independence, you know, he was hailed as a hero and people would say that, hey, you, you won independence for India. And he said, it wasn't me. It was Britain's Labour Party uh, who gave it to me. And it was, it was, it was said in, in jest, but it's quite a thing for someone, you know, a major figure to say that about about a colonial power, and then I, when I saw this episode with when Prince Philip talks about Harold Wilson and he's kind of rails about you know how he's going to have their heads on spikes and uh, it's uh, like like you said you know you, it's your creative imagination in that moment about what they would say and what they would feel, um, but is there ever a, a inner critic in you that tells you how far you can take this or uh, and of course it comes over time but how do you measure that how do you measure your creative license versus the weight of weight of you know the fictional history that exists among us anyway i uh, well i take that responsibility quite seriously because you know um there are an awful lot of for, for a start, as we move further and further forward in time and the, the, the season that I'm writing now, which we will be filming, uh, God willing, next year, um, 
takes place in the takes place in the 90s the 1990s so everybody from that era with the exception of the princess uh, princess of wales uh princess diana everyone is still alive and um and obviously you know it's easier to take liberties when you're writing about people in deep history or people that no one knows or um so you know i'm very conscious of my responsibilities as a dramatist and and i think the only thing you have to do is listen to your conscience it's um you have uh there is there is a moral and ethical component to the job that i do and i can't just write what how i want it to be there is also i'm limited by what we know happened um and so uh I hope that people are very, very, um, an audience is a sophisticated and intolerant judge. Uh, if the audience, the, you can't fool an audience. If the audience feels that you're being irresponsible and that you're being uh, dis, not disrespectful to people, but disrespectful to historical complexity and historical truth, um, they will reject you. Uh, and I think, I, I hope the fact that they haven't rejected the show means that they recognize how seriously we take the responsibility to get it as right as we possibly can, whilst at the same time, um, you know, try to push the boundaries for what's been said about these people before in terms of the complexity of their internal lives. Yeah, absolutely. I think pushing the boundaries, I think, is, is a really good way to put it because. Uh, all these people and also people through history uh, have been prone to saying, you know, really colorful things, things that can't necessarily be said out loud in, in the world that we live in today, uh, you know, for better or for worse. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of things that, that are attributed to historical figures, uh, they, they wouldn't be able to say that in this time, and which is what I find really intriguing about the show, that the show, show captures that, captures that time when, you know, uh, people will talk like that. You know, yeah. uh, uh, you know uh, uh, to digress a little bit, and this may be a little te technical question, but again, I'm being I'm being a little selfish here because I uh, I trying to find ways this will help my own writing. Uh, it's uh, you know the certain episodes that uh, take us away from the queen and provide a larger context of the world, like say the episode about the Suez Canal crisis. In that particular one, uh, perhaps the Queen is making an appearance and book ending it, but the meat of it is with, with other characters, with, you know, of with, I think it was Anthony Aiden facing that time. And uh, I want to talk to you about those episodes. Like, is there a, and I know there's certainly not a formula, there's an instinct there, but but as you're creating these seasons and in your experience of the last three seasons and now the fourth one, um, do you find that it's important to go away from the central character and then come back to her? And how often? And, I, and it doesn't have to be a formula, but it's kind of like, uh, I'm just wondering about the difference between, a, because when I'm writing a movie, I'm always conscious that uh, it's similar, like the subplot has to feed into into the sort of the central plot in some way. I'm trying to, you know, go into this alleyway and find my way back into that. Uh, but how do you do that over the breadth of a series of these 10 episodes? Well, I, I think with every, I don't think there's a rule because I think with every show, you would find a, a, a new normal. And that, you know, I think that for some shows, like a show like 24, for example, you're pretty much with that guy the whole time. And um, as he's unpicking things and, and um, but, but uh, it, it's tricky with, uh, with, with the queen because she's a very, uh, she's a, she's not an extravagant character. And, and, and she's not a character of whom one could say, I'll give you an example, right? I, I, I've mentioned this before, but Tony Soprano, huh, in, in, you know, in that wonderful show, The Sopranos, he's a character of whom anything is possible. 
And therefore, you can, you can take him in any direction and it would feel consistent with his character. It's a very narrow corridor of acceptable deviation for Elizabeth Windsor. Um, she is a narrow and specific character who behaves in an entirely predictable way, which is what has been her enduring strength. It's a nightmare for a dramatist because what you want to do is take her every way and, and push her in radical new directions. But of course, that wouldn't feel true to her. Um, and so I am more and more trying to open this up into more of an ensemble piece in which you can then go and enjoy other characters and their flamboyance or their, you know, their different emotional You know, the keyboard has a bigger range emotionally if you start in including other characters. However, every time you deviate too far from the Queen, I have discovered uh, to my cost um, in terms of needing then to do reshoots and whatever, um, I, I, every time you deviate too far from her, the show doesn't feel like the crown. It feels like something else. It, 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 and, and so there are, I've discovered there are certain elements which if you don't include them in an episode, it, you, you pretty much run aground. And I think in our, the long answer to your question, uh, made short, is um, you have to discover about your own show what the handful, maybe it's five or six core elements are without which an episode would feel like it had come in from another show, and which is not a good feeling. Mm. Um, and, uh, and for me, one of those core elements is at some point in the episode to see how the drama has affected the crown. And by the crown, I mean, if it's, if it's not the queen, then it has to be, it has to be the next in line or, or some reflection back to who was previously on the crown. That the crown itself has to be in some shape or form involved in every episode. And, and the crown needs either to be threatened or involved as a institution or as the individual person at the heart of it. Hmm. Hey, you know, that is like, and I know from writing, to be able to articulate your work, like what you're doing in, in that sentence or two that you just did, is, is that something that you've been able to do now or were you always able to do say that about oh, the no. crown? No, 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 it, no, no, I wasn't able to do that because you learn. I mean, and, and, and you know, the, okay, so with a really long running show, you have different, you, you, you have a whole different set of challenges that exist to on a movie. So for, I'll give you another example, just even on the simple business of keeping a show like this on the road mm -hmm. is very different to a movie in which you could, for example, you could, with a movie, everybody involved in the movie, you, I'm assuming that the shooting time will be about two months, maximum mm -hmm. three months, sometimes just a month. Um, you can put up with pretty much anything for that period of time, no matter mm -hmm. how extreme the challenge is in terms of the physicality, or, or you might have a complete nightmare actor at the heart of it, or you might be shooting nights, or you might be struggling with a half-finished script. But you can pretty much keep up, put up with anything for a short period of time. When you're doing a show like ours, our shoot is nine months long. It's a nine-month shoot. And, and uh, in, order to, in order to survive that, you've, you've got to really, everybody's got to really understand how to do it, because no sooner have they finished, then they're going to start doing it again shortly afterwards, or you know, they get a brief time to recover. I don't because I go straight into the editing and then I start writing and go straight into the next season. And so, from a manageability point of view, from a from a um, uh, from an endurance stamina point of view, you have to figure out how to do it, and you have to have some degree of self-conscious understanding of what it is that you're doing and how it is that it works. And um, we've been doing it now since 2014, uh, or well, I've been writing it since 2013. So that's eight years of, seven, eight years of experience 
and, and, and I'm still learning. And as a production entity, it's pretty much exactly the same team has stayed together the whole time because we all love doing it so much. We, you know, it's a, it's a job that makes everyone happy, which is amazing, actually, because films can often make you really miserable. And, uh, and, and this one, we've, you know, thanks to a wonderful producing team, we've made into something of a family. And, uh, and of course, part of that is figuring it out, how to, how to make it a, like a business, like a, foot, like a team. It feels very much, I, the thing I most identify with is sporting documentaries where I hear about coaches talking about how to produce the best of their team. And, and in order to do that, you have to understand the mechanics, not just of the sport you're playing, but the group of people at the heart of the team. And, uh, and, and, and those are part of the challenges that are different, say, from a novelist who's sitting at home. You know, this is part of what I do has to also involve figuring out how it works with a huge group of people. I, it's many hundreds of people work on this show. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there's a there's a really interesting sort of uh, rhythm and flow to the whole thing. Like like what I mentioned about the Suez Canal crisis, and then there'll be an episode which is you know fairly intimate. And then in this third season, there is you know the thing with Porchy, and and now they are older, and and you know it's still simmering, and uh, <laughs> it's so much fun for a writer just to go inside and outside and. Uh, it's a tremendous task, but I imagine it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun, which otherwise I would have given it up. You know, I, I, I you know, uh, like you as a writer, we're fortunate in that, you know, we, we don't need to wait for someone else to do our work. We can do it on our own. We can, we can self-initiate. We can, we can. Um, and so if, if I didn't, if I didn't like doing this job, I, I have no fears about stopping and doing something else. No fears at all. The fact that I'm continuing is because I'm still in the process of discovering how to do it better, you know, and, and I'm not bored by it because happily, we're moving through time, moving through different eras, which feed me, and and have the challenge of working with different casts. You know, rather than being stuck in with one cast over multiple years, the change, the refreshing change, is is good for the actors because they don't feel imprisoned, and it's good for us because we feel like we're constantly keeping on our toes, trying to understand who this new cast is. You know, hearing you just articulate that uh, sentence that you said about how everything impacts the crown, the institution in some way, that's really, that was really interesting to me uh, because I know that to, to make that statement for a writer is it's, it's years and months of work to, yeah. get there, to be able to say that about your own work. And I'm, you know, it's, 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 really, it's really wonderful to see that, see that uh, I'm not alone, alone in that. Uh, you, you have five minutes to audience questions to tell me. So, you know, I, I'll, uh, I wanted to ask you this. In, um, you also have the burden of history, then, then going from crisis to crisis as a dramatist, keeping all these relationships, you know, simmering in a life. But, but then there is also the, do you react to what's going on now in the world? With all the stuff that's happening outside, with this COVID stuff. And you know what Boris Johnson famously just said about, oh, there is such a thing as community. And, and then your fourth season has Thatcher in it who says there is no such thing as a community. Uh, society. <laughs> society, yeah. <laughs> but how do you, uh, do you are you going to take that into account? Are you going to rewrite? And, and you don't have to reveal much uh, about this, about what's coming. Because, you know, we'd much rather find out when we watch it. But, but do you do you take into account in your work what's going on around you in the world right now? So you can't help, uh, you know, particularly with a family like this, and and also because I always keep a prime minister in there. Uh, you know, one of the other core elements that defines the crown as the crown is that there is to have these private audiences, and that these private mm -hmm. audiences between government and crown, and. Um, uh, with the headlines coming thick and fast, whether it's about Meghan's wedding, Harry, Harry, Meghan and Harry, or I don't know what, some scandal involving Prince Andrew, or the temptation is constantly 
to rewrite. And then, of course, you understand that the news cycle is so quick and that uh, within 48 hours, often, there's such an appetite for other headlines. Um, I, 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 I've really tried to stick to the principle. One of the reasons why I want to stop writing The Crown going forward, although I'm very interested in exploring maybe what happened before the crown started, so maybe going back to the late 19th century, which mm. interests me enormously. The, the, um, the problem of coming too close in time to where we are now is that you lose the possibility for metaphor. Uh, there comes a point where you're too close in history to what it is that's happening. Uh, if you write about it, it can only work on that particular level. Whereas, if you were to, for example, tell the story of uh, uh, Edward VIII and Mrs. Simpson, for example, it would be impossible not to start drawing parallels between Meghan and Harry. Uh, mm. Even as I'm writing the story of uh, uh, Princess Diana, um, uh, which I always said I wouldn't want to do uh, because it's too close, but I now realize that Diana and Charles got married 81, 91, 91, 40 years ago. So that's really, that's two generations. And, and, and I feel quite comfortable with writing something, even as long as there's one generation between me and the event, mm. there will be an opportunity for metaphor within it, rather than just journalism. And, uh, and the, upper, the idea that if I write something, I'm, I really don't want to lead the audience. I, I, I'm so excited. When I wrote The Stag in The Queen, the movie, I deliberately wrote it in a non-prescriptive way. I, didn't, I wasn't thinking this stag represents the queen or this stag represents uh, this or vulnerability or hunting or the loss of innocence or whatever it was. And I was so enjoying listening to people's interpretations of it, which in many cases were much more imaginative and much more interesting than anything I could have thought up. And it's the same with telling these stories. I want people to come and make their own associations and their own, and you have to just trust that an audience will do that because they'll do it in 30 seconds. In your movie yesterday, the minute uh, I saw her left on her own with her daughter at the end i started putting together the association was she the person will she become the person that takes her own life will she take her daughter and do that i was immediately in my own head was 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 putting all sorts of things together that you may or may not have intended and uh I, you know I, I i'm excited that an audience brings that to work and, and, and sometimes we've just got to make sure we just write it and step back and let the people participate in the creation of the narrative. Yeah, no, that's, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's a wonderful gift. You're leaving a window open for people to come in and when they come in, it's, it's just wonderful. You know, somebody's asking a question about one of my favorite characters. So I'm going to pick that. Uh, Tommy Lassells, you know, he's just uh, such a steady hand on, uh, on the whole operation. Uh, there's a question about uh, throwing some light on his personality. He seemed to be such an important go-to person over the years. Um, yeah, I guess the question, I, I mean, I will paraphrase the question with it's more of a comment, uh, but his, uh, his personality, that personality, is that, is that a creation of yours or is that, is that a, come, that does this come from research? Both, but I, I'm thrilled to have this conversation because he is the exact example of what I was talking about earlier, where you have a small part. So when we did the very first reading of, uh, of The Crown, before season one even started, we got all the, we didn't even get, we had, didn't even have our cast. We just had a group of actors reading it so that I could hear the story. Mm -hmm. And... Pip Torrens, who is the actor who played Tommy Lassells, it's wonderful. Then. Was spectacular in the read through, and I went, "Oh my God!" There's something Edwardian about his demeanour, his voice. Mm -hmm. He wasn't an actor putting on that voice. He speaks like that, mm -hmm. and 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 so I thought, "I'm all in with this guy," and I started rewriting the scripts to make him a much more pivotal character. So. When, when, you're, when the questioner was saying, he seems like a go-to character, he, he was a go-to character for the Queen, and he's a go-to character to hold the monarchy together, but he was also 
for me, the writer, he was a go-to character because I just loved writing for him. And I loved what he did with what I, I loved what he did with my words. And, uh, and so I kept writing more and more for him. Everybody knew I was slightly in love with him. No, he's just wonderful, yeah, just wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, somebody's asking a question which is like a broader one, and I think maybe it's a nice one to mix it up, is that you, you've written so many uh, successes and, and things that have connected with people, but what is your, your proudest achievement? Without having to choose from your babies, but what, what gives you more, the most satisfaction, I guess, creatively? Um, uh... There, no, there are certainly some I'm more proud of than others. Uh, and that normally has to do with when I feel that all the elements have come together in a, in, in a particularly interesting way, where also I think that the filmmaking that I particularly admire um, has also come, you know, there have been times perhaps where, you know, because that's also a language. The way in which the director shoots, the way in which the editor edits, the mm. way in which the composer composes, these are all separate languages. And, and obviously I have my own preferences and taste about the way, and when all those things come together on something that I've written, it makes me proud and I feel like a sort of fanboy where I, where I watch, you know, I love the way you shot your movie. I, 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 I love the way you held takes I loved the way you were patient and let actors do what they did within the take. I loved the long lenses. I loved the way you lit things. And so, you know, having a director who shoots in that language and speaks in that language and treats his actors in that way, come and do my words, that will end up being one of those ones where I go, where I'm particularly proud of it or whatever, because the whole thing in its entirety is a sort of, as a collective experience, you know, is, um, you know, uh, th that will contribute to me being particularly proud of a certain piece. Sure, no, absolutely. You know, when everything, it's such a concert of talents, it's uh, things coming together is such a rare, yeah. rare reference. Uh, like everything working in concert. Um, and, you know, to that question, while I wait for another question that, uh, maybe I should just pick one here. Uh, somebody's asking, uh, how uh, I mean, she's a wonderful actor. So, but uh, how did you come up with the idea to cast Gillian Anderson as Margaret Thatcher? Uh, well, we can ask question. her. I can't, yeah. uh, she, she, she's upstairs somewhere. But she, yeah. she, uh, she, <laughs> she. Um, uh, I, to be honest with you, I, I, I really w wanted to work with her anyway. We'd worked together in Last King of Scotland, but but we, we, we didn't know each other then. And um, Yeah, me too. I would love to work with her someday. Yeah, she's fantastic. Well, she's a big fan of yours too. So, so um, but uh, uh, I, I, to be honest with you, I could see her doing it. I, I, it. It wasn't a stretch. And then obviously it would be up to me to, to, to make that choice, but I didn't want to. I figured, oh my God, you know, people will, 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 will make people criticize us for, you know, and I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't just being, you know, a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to make sure that I, you know, was thinking straight. And, and so I went to the casting director and I said, look, I've been thinking that Gillian could be great as Thatcher. And she went, oh my God, that's, you know, that's the perfect idea because it's, it's shocking and surprising, but she's also exactly the kind of actor that yeah. fits in with the crown. It's a slightly surprising uh, pick. It's not an obvious pick. And yet, I mean, I can't, I'm looking forward to you seeing it. You know, I'm very proud of what she's done, and it's a, it's a fantastic mm -hmm. performance. I don't know. I think it's such a wise choice. You know, somebody was asking me, one of my actor friends was asking me, what, what do people look for in, a, in an audition? And I couldn't be, think of anything to be helpful except to say that uh, everybody who's sitting there is looking to be surprised. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a just wonderful choice. It's just a wonderful, I, I can't wait to watch it. Uh, I'm just gonna pick one of the questions here. Oh, this is, I mean, I, I think you've answered this in so many ways and in talking about the creative process. Uh, but I, I, this is something that I think you have to deal with often being asked this question. Uh, how do you deal with the criticism of the royal family uh, while developing this show, which is centered around them? I guess, what, how do you 
do you even deal with it the no not really i mean uh uh i i, I it it's probably hard for me to say this without it and sat and for it to sound believable but i'm not that interested in the royal family i i i was never a royal watcher i couldn't care less uh, i even have conflicted feelings about whether we should or shouldn't have a monarchy i mean it's a it, it's a preposterous idea it makes no sense um it doesn't stand up to logical scru the scrutiny of logic um, but then many of the best things in life don't stand up to the scrutiny of logic. And, and uh, um, w when they behave the way they do, I never, 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 I mean, I, I used to get asked a lot. Now I think people know I will never speak about it. Um, I'm really keen for the royal family to have total uh, independence from this show. I don't want there to be any connection whatsoever. I never want them to know what I think about what they've done, and I don't want to know what they think about what I've done. And we can exist in completely respectful denial of one another. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, I think even your show is going to become part of this, part of the history of the royal family. It's going to be a, a it's going to be how people, uh, people perceive the royal family through this show. And you know, I, I've never felt, when I've been watching a show, I've never felt more sorry for them. Uh, yeah. and, and also equally infuriated. I think it's a, it's a really, uh, it's about the people. Uh, it is about the institution, but it's also about the people, which is wonderful about it. Uh, but here's, here's a, I think this is a good question to, to end with because it's, a, uh, it's an obvious one. Um, what is that, what has been your most memorable moment uh, or memory relating to this show, to this whole experience through these four seasons? Um, uh, I, I, it's, I suppose, it, you know, when we first started, um, there's always that first moment when you start seeing the rushes come through and you start thinking, oh, this is what it's going to look like. This is what it is. Um, and and uh, most of the time I'm too busy to take a view. And I have not had yet in all the seven or eight years that I've been doing it, that cigar moment where I'm reflecting on precisely this sort of a question. So that's why I'm slightly thrown by the question because I'm always so in it that I'm not outside yeah. it enough to be able to have a bird's eye view of it. Yeah. I'm still in the middle of it, but I think I think probably the moment it first when you first pick all the heads of department, you first pick all the you know the the, the lighting, the cameraman, you know you've chosen the actors, you've got a director, and they start to shoot. And I remember I think the first time that we did that at the end of the first episode when we cut that together and the ducks were being killed by the dying king. Um, I remember thinking, I like, I like, I like what I'm seeing. I like the complexity of what mm. I'm seeing. And, um, and, and so, uh, you know, I found it harder the more modern it gets. I'm more excited when it's the distant past and the, and, and, and the eccentricity of that anthropology mm. and things are more bizarre, mm. the way people behave with one another. But. I do, I, I do think there's something about that very first episode and the ducks being killed and hearing the music for the first time and thinking, wow, yeah, I can, I can live with this for a bit. You know, the actors that show up for the small parts, they're there for a couple of episodes or for a episode and they never leave your consciousness. I mean, in relation to this uh, uh, show, uh, the actor who plays the Dying King, uh, the actor who painted uh, Churchill's yes. portrait, such a wonderful actor. And of course, Tommy Lascelles, who we were talking about now. I mean, these uh, characters and actors, I mean, I, I did really leave, left a real impression on me as that painter, you know, I, I, I do think of him often. He's just such a wonderful, he, he brought Stephen that out. Delane. Stephen, Stephen Delane yeah. is a wonderful actor. Also recently in this last season, the one who was the Welsh teacher of Prince of Wales as he was learning mm -hmm. Welsh. I don't know if you saw that episode, but he mm -hmm. died recently. The, the real character died this week. and. And thankfully, because of the show, he got massive obituaries in, in, in you know, and I'm not saying he wouldn't have got them anyway because he was a, a significant Welsh nationalist, but 
it was wonderful to see a character like that get the kind of recognition that he deserved. And, and his performance by the actor Mark Lewis Jones, that was another one of those performances which I thought, wow, you know, that was such a privilege mm -hmm. to get. Mm -hmm. No, so that's a, that's the real pleasure of it also is to that there's these, these great central performances, but then also there's these people who show up for an episode or two who really, you know, it speaks to the depth of the material as well, that they come and get to do these wonderful things. But hey, this has been such a pleasure for me, such an honor and yes, a real treat in these, in these times. Uh, hey, I'll ask you one more question before we sign out. What, what are you doing next? Do you know? Or is that important? No, I mean, I, I, I constantly think of other ideas, but, um, and I wrestle with, I have to choose whether to continue doing The Crown, because I think Netflix would very much like me to continue doing The Crown uh, in one form or another, um, and, uh, and maybe doing other things. But at the moment, I'm still, I'm still loving every minute of doing this, and, and it's hard to imagine doing something else, but I, I do have one or two ideas. Okay, great. Look forward to them. All right, Such a pleasure talking to you, Peter. And you. Thank you so much, Ritesh. Thank you so much, Peter. I mean, that was incredible, so considered. And Peter, your, your sense when you're talking about the first rushes coming in and you're getting a sense of what, what the film is really sounded like the first night in a theatre production. Yeah. When you're waiting at the, at the back of the hall with bated breath, holding your breath to see how that would turn out. We'd love to have both of you back. I mean, there's so much to talk about your theater uh, world, uh, Ritesh, your incredible film and all the work that you've done. And as you said, stuff that you really love, stuff that surprises you, surprises the audience. But thank you both so much for being on this show. And I do hope you'll stay safe. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that we couldn't take all the questions that you were streaming in. And uh, there were so many, but we promise perhaps we can send some of them forward and we'll get some of the answers and send them back to you. So thank you, Peter, and thank you, Ritesh, for that brilliant conversation. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. And we thank our official radio partners, Red FM, Bajate Raho. Please also do tune in at 9 p.m. for our next session, Kiran Mazumdar's show on COVID, healthcare, and the life sciences. <laughs> An important and urgent conversation between Kiran Mazumdar's show, executive chairperson, Biocon Limited, and writer and journalist, Saman Subramaniam, on the challenges of the pandemic and India's response to it. They discuss the way forward and the opportunities the crisis throws up for India to emerge as a global hub for the life sciences. For those of you who are willing to stay logged on, we have a special extract from the Jaipur Music Stage archives. The Chicago Children's Choir inspires and unites youth from diverse backgrounds to become global citizens through music. Founded in Hyde Park in direct response to the civil rights movement in 1956, CCC has grown from one choir into a vast network of in-school and after-school programs serving over 5,000 students across the city of Chicago. Here's presenting an extract of their performance from the Jaipur Music Stage archives, beginning with a soul rendering of the national anthem. Enjoy the evening. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the singing of the Indian National Anthem. Yeah.
And on behalf of the Chicago Children's Choir, I'd like to say welcome. We'd like to thank um, our artistic directors, dear friends, Mr. San Joy Roy and Ms. Anu Bahar for inviting us, as well as the U.S. Embassy. We are very excited to be here with you all and to share in your culture. Your country is absolutely beautiful. The Chicago Children's Choir was founded during the heights of the height of the civil rights movement in an effort to bring children of diverse backgrounds together through music in the Chicago land area. We serve around 3,000 children now and 50 plus years later, we're still continuing that mission by practicing a very diverse repertoire. In respect for time, we did make a few adjustments to the program, but we promise to give you a little taste of everything that we do. And by the end of the concert, we hope that you will feel our spirit as we feel yours. We'd also like to acknowledge Mr. Jishan Bhandawadi, whose family are natives of India. Um, he played one of the leading roles, uh, Shiva, in our um, world musical, Indian-themed world musical, uh, this past December. And so we're very happy to have him. He started out the show. So again, thank you so much for coming, and please enjoy the rest of the performance. <laughs> 